Our next speaker, she's a chartered environmentalist, a UNESCO special envoy for youth and the environment. Um, She's Managing Director of Sustainability Consultants Element 4, um, who I see from their website are, are leaders in disruptive sustainability, which, which I thought sounded brilliant. Um, uh, please, will you welcome Georgia Elliott Smith? Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, yes, my name's Georgia Elliott Smith. I'm the managing director of Element 4. So, thank you, Martin. That's um, a great introduction. We work exclusively in the construction and real estate sector. Um, so, our clients are developers, asset managers, investors, uh, also contractors. Uh, we don't yet work for any FM companies, though. So, you know, if anybody's interested, come talk to me after. Um, but what we do is we set strategies for uh, real estate portfolios or for individual development projects. Uh, yeah. SG strategies or as it used to be called sustainability strategies but they've you know working in this field there's a new term every year that you need to get used to so for anybody who doesn't know because I realize a lot of people don't know ESG stands for environmental social and governance even people I've employed don't necessarily know what that stands for when they come and join us they think it's like environmental sustainability and something else groovy um, so yes, I'm going to talk to you about the power of strategy. Before I do though, there was a point you made, Martin, earlier, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and I just wanted to come back on it immediately. So, you know, over the years of working in this sector, what I have come to realise and what I talk to all my clients about is there is no such thing as cheap. There's no such thing as cheap. Somebody pays the cost. And if you are saving money, that is because somebody else is paying. And they are paying because their human rights are being abused. Or they're paying because they're suffering pollution. Or they're paying because their community is degraded. So if you are getting something cheap, the question to ask yourself is where is the actual cost of this thing? And that's, I think, something that really brings it home when we're talking about that, because that means people are being paid less. It means that the products we're using are not sustainable. So when we look at environmentally responsible and socially responsible products, yes, there is a cost, but that cost is being put in, the, in your pocket rather than somebody else's. So when we start with the ESG strategy, that's a good little principle to keep in mind. So what I'm going to talk to you about, first of all, is this. Welcome to the environmental talk. <laughs> this is, I'm sure, hopefully you won't see too many of these slides. But I like to start here because I have worked for 25 years in the environmental sector. I started my career as an environmental engineer working in the UK construction industry. I was one of the first dedicated environment managers. Started working for Bovis um, as an undergraduate. Um, came out into industry and the first thing that I was dealing with was let's not burn rubbish on site. Let's not chuck oil in the river. And then gradually, gradually, you know, work's become more sophisticated and we've started talking about big sustainability principles and things like carbon footprinting and everything's got moved onto spreadsheets and we talk about lots of systems and things that are intellectually you know, can be interesting or can become very geeky and very dull, depending on who you are. I'm the geek. I'm extremely excited by all this stuff. But I ended up getting to a place in my career where it was all just very theoretical. And I was feeling like on every project it was just token things we were doing. We were doing a little bit here, a little bit there. We were reporting, brilliant, 90% of waste diverted from landfill, yay! 10% carbon reduced on this project, hooray for us. But so what? Does that actually matter? What really are the issues that we're dealing with here? Because what we're really dealing with here is life on Earth. And when we're sitting in our suits at work, we don't really think about that stuff. You know, that is, we like to keep a, a nice cold distance from that. But in 2018, I had my kind of rebirth as an activist. So I was watching the Attenborough documentaries, the IPCC report had come out, the 1.5 degree report telling us we only had 12 years before catastrophic tipping points were reached. And I realized that in my entire 20 year at that point career, I had just been making it worse because I'd been enabling corporates to say that they were doing enough and they weren't because if they were, we wouldn't be at this point in history. 
And so I sort of had my long dark nights of the soul and I realised that actually what I was doing was actually contributing to making it worse. So I then joined Extinction Rebellion. I became an out and out activist. Last year I took the UK government to court over their failure to adequately price carbon emissions. So I was there in the High Court, you know, with the Secretary of State's barrister and all of the legal team there. And I started to bring into boardrooms and bring into construction sites and bring into all of the people that I was speaking to this urgency to understand what we're playing for and to really mean it, not just be talking about a few numbers here and there. You know, and I think, you know, it's a bit icky to talk about that, but I do like to start here. So I think unless you're made of stone, actually you do care about these things. But when you come to work, it's very difficult to translate that into what do I actually do about this thing? How do I start caring about that and doing something meaningful at work? And what we end up doing is this. And I'm sorry for everybody who's, because I know, I know what it's like, you know, this is what you end up doing and then this becomes your life, right? And then you become the person who everybody goes, oh sorry, I'm not recycling, I put it in the wrong box, you know, and then you become evangelical on the floor, you know, and everybody's saying to you, oh sorry, I'm not recycling well enough. I, ha I hate to break it to you, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. This is not strategic. Now, it's fine, it's okay to have it, but it's not important. And I just want to draw your attention to one thing, if we go back to this slide. That top corner, the plastics that are suffocating the ocean, have got nothing to do with this. This is not making a single impact on that. So I just want to kind of disabuse you of that and start talking about how actually we can be much, much more strategic to deal with the bigger issues and not just get obsessed with that. Now the thing about this is it feels good because you feel like you're doing something and actually it's dealing with the thing that you can see. The thing that you can see day to day is rubbish being produced and so that feels good, I'm doing something here. But actually the bigger things, the most important things are the things you can't see. So that's why it's so important to have a real strategy. And this is my first really core cool message to our clients. Anyone can change. I can put on a new lipstick, you know, I can get a different haircut, anyone can change. But change only matters if it is meaningful. So we start from a place of what is meaningful to this business and what is meaningful on a global scale. That's where we start. We don't start with the recycling bins because that's the wrong way round. So how do we measure what's meaningful? Hands up if you've ever worked with this before. Brilliant, brilliant, because I'm evangelical about this, okay. So for those of you who haven't seen this before, this is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, came out in 2015. Now the aim of this was that it should be achieved by 2030. So, you know, it's kind of like ambitious, I like that, let's start big. 17 goals. Now, this is the global framework for achieving sustainable development. Nowhere on there is recycling bins. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> However, we do have number 12, responsible consumption and production. Now, what this is talking about is what are you buying? Do you need to buy it? Shouldn't we really be talking about zero waste operations? So, you know, what you do with it at the end of its life, yeah, it's interesting, but it's not really the big deal. The big deal is what are you buying in the first place? Do you need it? And can we get rid of it in the first place? Are you putting your money in a place that's responsible? Are you supporting sustainable consumption? What are you doing with your money? No poverty, you know, so we have been talking a lot this morning about climate, no poverty, Martin mentioned this morning. You know, we can go on a fun run, we can raise some money for Oxfam, you know, that helps people very far away, you know, and, and we can feel good about that, nice. But, what about the people in your supply chain? 11%, this is stats from last year, 11% of people in the UK, in full-time employment, live below the poverty line. Now that, in this economy, that's an absolute travesty, and many of those people are people in your supply chains. So that's something we can do about poverty on our own doorstep, to really start tackling that and making sure we're driving London living wage, or living wage nationally, through our supply chains, and really deal with the causes of the issues. 
The next thing I'm going to talk about is science-based targets. Now, science-based targets, SBTI, this is one initiative. The science-based targets initiative is something for carbon emissions. And what it is about is saying, OK, globally, there is a carbon budget. There is an amount of carbon that we globally can emit before we bust through the two degree centigrade global temperature rise. So of that big pie of carbon globally, a section of that pie belongs to the UK, and then a smaller section of that slice belongs to the real estate sector. So that is our budget for how much carbon we can emit and co before we contribute to greater than two degrees centigrade global temperature rise. Right, so that's science-based calculations for you. Those calculations exist for other things like resource consumption, so if we can seek out those science-based metrics, we then start to get some perspective on what is our contribution here. Are we contributing more or less to the overall impact? And are we performing as we should based on science? So we move away from saying, let's just reduce by 10% from what we did last year. Because that's what a lot of people do. They just think as long as we move forwards a little bit, then we're doing enough. But that's not right. We need to look at it in a proper science-based context. And it, it was really nice what you know, we heard earlier from Yutunde about looking at these big science-based frameworks and then benchmarking our performance against them to see whether or not, actually this is something we're doing pretty good about. We can put that on a back burner for now because we're, we're all right. There are other priorities we need to focus on. Um, or whether it's something that we are lying way outside the curve and we actually then need to, to really act on to bring it in. And then that helps us set our priorities about where we spend our money and our time and our effort. So has anybody seen this before, CREM, the CREM curve? No? Brilliant. Okay, I'm really glad I've shown you. I'm sure somebody else today looking at the topics is going to be talking about this, so I'll just whiz through it. But CREM, the Carbon Risk Real Estate Monitor, okay, what this curve shows you, so the green line through the middle, that shows you, I just explained the carbon budget for property, that shows you the decarbonisation curve for UK property, that shows how we have to decarbonise in order to achieve our Paris Agreement commitments. So that is, it doesn't matter how your building performs, it will be somewhere on that graph. Now is it to the right of the curve, which means it's consuming too much carbon, or is it to the left of the curve, which means that it's great, it's on track, it's performing well against the Paris Agreement uh, targets. What this helps us to do is to work out at what point the carbon emissions from your property will cross that curve, and at that point your property needs to be retrofitted to reduce its carbon emissions. So here we're thinking strategically now about when does this building have to be retrofitted in order to decarbonise in line with the Paris Agreement. And this is a really simple calculation, but it's something that takes us out of the day-to-day -day and puts us on a map to say how are we performing in a global context and does decarbonisation on this building matter or should we focus our efforts on a different asset that's performing worse? So, you know, again, this is how we work strategically. So, as I mentioned, strategic priorities are really important. So, one thing I'm going to talk to you about now strategically, has anybody heard of the TCFD? Okay, one person, a couple of people at the back, yeah. This is really, really, really important. I cannot stress that enough. Too many reallys, but really, really important. So the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures. How am I doing for time? You're fine. Am I all right? Good. The Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures. It's a bit of a mouthful. You know, everybody in sustainability loves a, a little kind of acronym like this. Um, it is an initiative that was established a few years ago by Michael Bloomberg and Mark Carney. Uh, former Governor of the Bank of England, and it was a way of recognising that the big financial institutions were not adequately disclosing the impact that they had on the climate, but equally the impact that the changing climate was having on their assets. 
And so they set up a voluntary initiative for big financial institutions to start measuring and reporting those two things. So your impact on the climate, the climate's impact on your assets. So that then investors could start to understand how is my investment going to perform over time? Is it a liability? Is it going to become stranded? You know, what are the risks related to climate with this asset? Now, what's really important about this is that now we're seeing... So, as I say, this was voluntary. As of the 6th of April this year, this is, the government's made this mandatory. So now all large organisations are going to... Ha so all listed companies, but also all non-listed large companies... Uh, must create a TCFD report every year. Now that means that they have to measure their carbon emissions and report it, but they also have to report on what they're doing to mitigate those emissions, reduce them, and what they're doing for climate adaptation and resilience. So how is your building going to respond to overheating? What about flooding risk? What about sustainable urban drainage? All of these things are becoming important. And the reason for this, it's not just that it's good work for consultants like me, which of course, you know, we love stuff like this because it's forcing people to do something. But this will directly affect your business's ability to attract finance. So if you do not have a TCFD report, then you are a risk to an investor. So our clients who are uh, landlords, who are asset owners, and they rely on being able to obtain good finance, are going to find a significant problem if they do not have this TCFD report because their assets are going to be devalued. They're going to be mapped against that carbon curve and they're going to be seen to be a liability and on a carbon basis they will become stranded over time. And so this really is where the rubber starts to hit the road for a lot of our clients. And the reason I raise it here is because this is important for you as facilities managers to understand strategically what is important to our clients. Okay, Because now what's important is them being able to get good finance terms for their being able to get attract the best funds to invest in their real estate and for them to be able to report that they're doing the right things on climate, on mitigation, on all of these issues that I mentioned before. So as facilities managers, we need to know that that strategically has suddenly become really important for our clients overnight, okay? Not because they care about polar bears, but because they care about getting good finance and they don't want their assets to be devalued. And so, do you understand this? Do you understand what is required? Do you understand compliance, but do you also understand what it means to exceed compliance? And is your strategy linked to that? Because that's how you get the board members to really care about what you're doing. I'm going to just touch on something that's a little softer, a little less spreadsheety. But also, if we look at things like gender, we still, we still have a huge problem with making sure that we've got gender balance, particularly at the top of organisations, and I love this. Lots of ladies in the audience. Um, but what about our facilities? Are our facilities supportive of more women coming in to higher positions in organisations? Do we know? Have we done a study? Have we read any papers on this? What are our facilities doing? If this is a strategic priority for the owners of these assets or for the operators, you know, big corporates have got big goals around gender balance and gender pay gaps and so on. But what about our facilities? And this is looking at the strategic priorities of the organisations in those properties and looking at how we can bolster those strategic goals using the assets that we have. So again, what are your facilities doing to encourage, support, attract more women into the workforce? And is that a strategic priority for your business? So there we go, I'm just going to bring this up again. I feel sorry for them. I feel really sorry for them. But hopefully you'll remember now to go back to your office and go, yeah, that's nice, but I'm not going to stress about it, okay? I'm not going to say anything else about people putting things in the wrong box. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>